Hello, everyone, and welcome back to day 65 of Bitwise, where we code and design a complete computer from scratch. Uh, today, we are. We didn't really start the self hosting compiler rewrite last time. I ended up mostly explaining the stuff that had changed. Um, before we jump into today, I just want to mention I ended up pushing the mega commit with like, you know, 3,000 plus lines of code. So there's a bunch of stuff that I expected to break and did break. I've been uh, fixing things. Uh, some of it is just warning stuff that needs to, where I'm not throwing explicitly where I should. And so while that's a legal cast, it needs to be done more explicitly. And since some compilers was letting it through and others weren't, so I'm catching stuff like that. I also caught up and fixed a few more substantial bugs. But uh, I expect the next few days I will still be catching the long tail of stuff from that commit. Uh, so that's keeping me pretty busy. I actually didn't get a chance to work on the Lexer because of that at all, uh, because I'm just dealing with that stuff. Uh, and other things in life. Um, so today we're actually going to do the lecture properly. And uh, right before the stream started, or rather before the, the recorded video started, I just put finishing touches on something that will be potentially helpful and sort of a preview of the kind of tooling I want to do when, uh, when we have the new compiler, uh, which is uh, now. Uh, so I just created uh, ion.lexer, a uh, new, new module, which we'll be writing today and uh, just have a stub definition. And the idea is um, I have this simple utility that generates vcproj files, and they actually work across several vcproj versions. I got a nice template for doing multi-version vcprojs from someone on Twitter whose name I forget right now, but um, it, I have starred his original template if you go to my gist page. Uh, but anyway, now you can do something like this, and it knows about all your search paths. Um, so. Right now, this means that my Python script has to replicate the search path order and stuff that the compiler itself uses. But uh, going forward, all this, of course, will just be integrated into not really the compiler, but like the front end, the driver, the, the user interface to the compiler that you use. And so the idea here is you just go to a directory. And uh, in this case, it's just my base directory for my uh, VC solution. And I just specify the ion module. And as a result, it generates a correspondingly named uh, project folder, which initially just had uh, initially just had this file, and then uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, and so you can see now uh, it, this basically has the effect of um, doing all the command line setup in order to invoke the compiler. On, uh, on the package when you recompile, um, has the, the C file in here, uh, also has all the ion files, and it doesn't, it doesn't unlike my old crap, uh, I was, uh, uh, this one doesn't use wildcards, so if you add new ion files and you really want them to appear in the project listing, you can rerun the project file generator. Um, and so the idea is you should never really be editing this directly, you should always be editing the configuration that drives the template generation, because this is going to get clobbered every time you regenerate it. But um, so this is just going to be, you know, if you've used CMake or uh, PreMake or any of those tools, you kind of know the deal. But the point is, we actually need very thin wrappers because we're not trying to do anything fancy. So uh, I'm just going to do that myself, and uh, I just finished it right before the stream started. I'm sure that this is uh, going to get a lot better once we do a proper version, but. Um, I don't know why I did, didn't do this earlier, but now we have it, and uh, it seems to work. So um, let's actually start working on the Lexer today. Um, so if you recall, I don't recall what I said last time about what we wanted to do with the Lexer. I think I said something about how to manage stuff like this, uh, these keyword tables. Um, so maybe that is a good place to start, is to think about, uh, you know, now instead of having global variables, we're going to have some kind of lexer struct. <clears throat> um, I'm going to use std. And um, what do we need in our lexer struct? Well, um, we need some kind of current token. And uh, we need, um, let's just stop this in. So this is the current token. We need some kind of stream. 
stream cursor. And um, that's probably enough to get started. We, we also need some line tracking uh, and stuff like that. Um, so I actually deleted the code, the code or not, not working code, but the code I sketched on stream last time because I, I was closing my text editor and I was closing up a bunch of old, old uh, open uh, unsaved files. So I, I lost that, but that doesn't really matter. But I think we're going to take a similar approach where um, when we're lexing something, we are basically going to accumulate a set of all the line break positions. So I will have some kind of, um, I don't know what to call it. Um, actually, we're not going to do that. We're just going to use the cursor itself. So I will, uh, I will have a start cursor, which is where we started parsing. And then at any given point, I can subtract these two to find out the offset and I can emit a, um, I can emit lines, and so we're going to have um, a bunch of these line offsets. Um, so maybe let's let's do a simple version of that right now. Um, I'm going to use a lot shorter function names uh, because these are module local now, and uh, there's no reason to write next token when it's localized to the Lexer module. That's implied. So um, the kind of thing we will do, let's just do a simple line counter for now. Um, So zero initialized, that's totally fine. Um, I guess you need to do this to get started, to pump the state and fill in the first token. Um, and actually, that's not true. We don't return it, we fill it in in place. Um, and actually, we're just going to call this init because we have module local namespaces now. And I fixed a few bugs that was causing you to not be able to override things from other modules when you wanted to with local symbols, so that should be fixed. And then our next function, let's see, um, initially um, we're just going to, let's see, initially we're just going to um, maybe do line, line counting. Um, Actually, let's see, what, what could we parse to get started? Let's pick up a simple case. Um, Probably this should not be a char, but a byte offset or something like that. But for now, let's just do this. Um, um, what do we want to parse? I guess we'll start with something like this. Um, we'll use libc function qualified because I started introducing symbols like free and std that uh, collide. So um, actually, let's use them both without wildcard import. That's fine. These names are pretty short. Um, so let's see. As long as there's space to skip, we skip it. Um, 
line start is, let's see, right, so this is the current thing. And so basically when this happens, what you do is you A push the current stream offset. Um, and you don't even need to, the, the length of this automatically tracks, the length of this buffer tracks how many lines we have. Um, and then repeat, I think the way I do go to is like this. Prefix colon. Um, So let's see, let's take a simple case, simple-ish case, like maybe we'll just take, I don't know, a plus. Um, say um, and so it's probably fine let's not worry about how did we handle this here right so let's skip for now uh, we have to skip in this case too. Um, and then if we get to this point, we have a token. I guess we have to mark the end of the token. Um, push. Eh. Let's just do a bulk import of that. Oh god. I guess this is one of those issues people were running into with tuples not resolving or whatever. Um, okay. Maybe we have to fix that bug. Um, pre, pre, pre. Yeah, that's true. I cannot. I cannot do that. Um, so it looks like it's probably the bug people were reporting. Let me just spend. <laughs> I'm sorry for fixing these bugs in the stream, but. Uh, that's how it has to go. We actually have to use this data structure in a second for interning, so we need to fix it. Um, I think what's happening is that, uh, like this thing, the mere fact that there is something that references this um, in STD. Like we're not even using the name node. Um, you know what, it's probably this. Let's just stub this up for a sec. It's, it's, it's probably related to something about the, the That's not it. Um, so 
So it's tr it's clearly the fact that the mere fact of this thing being referenced is not provoking uh, a Ford declaration of name node. So this tuple This tuple, well, um, the problem is rather than emitting a declaration, it's emitting a Definition. So there must have been an original point where tuple was resolved. Somehow it didn't properly resolve its parts um, sorry guys this will be a detour this you're probably used to by now so this will be ion .lexer. and this will start a project So this is the tuple, I think. Right, so it came to this root. Came to this root through three. Right, so that I was right about at least this instance. So it's getting it's getting to that from here, um, and and then over here. Um, so right, this is just the first field. Here we have the second field. Um, so it has two fields. And this one is a pointer to a um, to a name node. Okay, let's see what happens here. This is a name node. Finds that. And it should go and resolve it. It thinks it's already resolved it. What is its state? Its state is resolved, reachable. Trying to remember what this whole natural reachable thing is. Reachable natural, is that what I call it? So, re so this is reachable forced. 
reachable force is when something you're not dependent on something, but you forced a connection to it just for the sake of getting compile errors. Um, and so the question then is, why isn't it? If this is the case, basically, when you force resolve something, you should put it on. Uh, let's see. If declaration is incomplete, I'm trying to remember what incomplete means. Oh yeah, that's just if it's like a foreign thing. Um, boom, 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 boom. Let's see. I guess we could do um, a conditional breakpoint. I would do like decal and decal sim. Well, there is a decal, but decal and decal sim and sim name equals name node equals zero. The following cannot be set. Decal has no member sim. Oh right. Because that's true. now. Th th this is one of the frustrating thing about breakpoints. It, it, I guess it doesn't happen in quite as obnoxiously if you do it while running, but the fact that it can't really, it, it doesn't even do syntax validation ahead of time. Okay. So, So this does the forced, forced reachability for everything. So it goes through and it says everything that's in their home package, let's do a forced reachability. Um, and so this is, so, so, so if you look at the type, this should be uh, like an incomplete type. It points back to the declaration. So we now mark it's resolved. Um, and normally you would say, why don't we, I thought sorted sims always go, oh, this is, let me just try something. Just to jog my memory of why this check is needed, I understand why you don't do this for incomplete declarations because you typically want external headers to handle those.
right? It's because this should only... Right, right, right. This should only happen just because I'm confused about what sorted sims. So everything... Well, there's at least one way to do it. No. Maybe that is the problem, actually, because I think when I do this, do I always complete these fields? So, so basically, I, I didn't give the background. Tuples are a little bit weird, and I was hoping to get away with it in the old compiler um, <clears throat> because a lot of the way, <coughs> excuse me, the whole completion thing works is designed to work with things that have names associated with them or decals. Uh, tuples are types, dynamically defined types, I guess, that, that originate not with decals, but just random type specs. The first thing to reference them essentially becomes the origin but there's no real sense in which one of them is distinguished. Um, I mean, it seems like one thing I could do would be for now to turn on, no, so again, this should not be the case. We already do that elsewhere. To turn on laziness Um, and then I can work on it more off stream. Pre-build event. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so let's say we have a lexer and we init it, um, and we just have a test string, like, um, we should probably make it global, just so we can see it in the debugger more easily from other stack frames. Um, so, Let's see here, plus, plus, double plus, I don't know. Um, expected equals or, oh right, it's not. Okay, and then here we have to, this interesting This may be related to my weird Oh, I had line sync turned off when I was dealing with that issue. 
The no, no line, by the way, I think I didn't explain this. This is something I checked in yesterday. No line sync. I had it originally as a debug option, but if you want to remove all the um, uh, pound line emissions, um, either for uh, telling me where a bug is um, without me having to do it, so where you can just see it yourself by looking at the C code, uh, then that's how you're supposed to do it. Self was null pointer. Oh, I'm really not thinking straight today. Um, I guess let's at least handle end of file seems pretty important um, so we're going to just handle that maybe at the top here um, and we will just have like an EOF token for that and it actually seems like a useful thing to have as a sentinel value. So let's just put that at the very top. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say while um, while lex lexer toke um, I guess we want to do this every iteration, so it's not quite this pattern. Um, one thing you can certainly do is how well, useful that is, but that's maybe too expensive or whatever to put it over. Let's just do it for convenience. Man, I started having, I was, for the last six months, like I didn't have any like back problems or anything at the computer, but because of when I'm streaming, I have to set up my side monitor and all this other gear behind things so that I end up moving my, my desktop like or my laptop way further into the table and so my posture goes to crap. Um, feel it. Okay, so uh, let's just say while, I guess we already called next, so maybe we actually don't do the pre-next. Um, Why are we getting zeros? Oh, because I'm not setting it. Um, probably need to do that. Need to do this.
Okay, I'm gonna try my, my lean back approach to not screwing up my posture. Um, and this would be took start, not self start. And so this is. Let me sync it back at the end. Okay, let's try that. Infinite loop apparently. Let's see what that was about. That's not what you want to do. So, as long as something is space, we do this. So why are we not, why is it going back here? Because these should count as space. Um, I guess let's see. So stir is pointing at the initial new line. And so currently we're at the new line. We advanced past the new line and in the process also did this. And now we're at a plus, so we don't go there. switching on the wrong thing. This might be a little bit too error prone, but for something like Alexa, I feel bad about relying too much on the compiler for the alias analysis, but it's probably, and just the typing of having to write self stir everywhere is annoying. Um, okay, so now we get the real token, we fill in the end, uh, and then we set that as the new thing and update the stir. Now we should get a one. Um, and at every at any given point you could let's just do that. Um, so this is line one, or I guess line two, it starts counting at zero. Um, so one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, and so on and so on. Okay. Um, so that gives us the line breaks. Um, we also, what was the structure we talked about last time? Um, I think actually we want to split this into a separate entity. Um, which I would just call a, uh, a source, uh, or, or maybe a file, but that's not really. Let's call it a file. Um, input file, let's call it source. Um, and so the source will have a path. Um, and it will have these line breaks. Uh, it will also have the actual data. Um,
So rather than using start, we're just going to have a current source. And this will be basically managed, like there will be some kind of source manager, which, you know, when you say open and read this file, or open and read this string, it's going to make sure it only gets read once and it's going to maintain all this index data so you can refer to it later. And so I think what we're going to do actually is we're going to pass in a source. Maybe I'll just call it like this. Um, and so uh, we don't need the start. And for this, we just say source stir. And then we keep that like this. Um, and I guess for now we can just uh, have something simple like this one. Set the first field. It is. Um, these other things are allowed to be null. Let's do it this way, and then see if that still works. Um, I guess if this is the way it works. Maybe you, you do want the Lexer to have, yeah, you want the Lexer to have its own internal line counter. Um, Um, so actually, let's um, let's do what we talked about doing. Some of the stuff I sketched out. Let's actually try to implement it and test it. So, if you recall, one thing I want to do is the idea of. Um, Um, I hate the word manager. I'm not going to call it a source manager. What should it be called? Maybe it's just sources. Um, and so there's a, a list of sources. Um, and Each of them there's a total basically there is a text buffer. Let's see, a logical text buffer. Is that the way to think about it? Yes, actually, let's that's the way to think about it, I guess. Um, so, don't know if this is the 
best term, but basically um, we have this notion of a 32-bit uh, position, and it's a position across the entire set of source files that are open. And so conceptually, if we parse a bunch of source code in order, uh, and imagine concatenating all the source for all the files we've concatenated, and zero means the very first byte and so on, or actually the very first token. No, the very first byte, the byte index. Um, then given that, if you know how long the files are, like if you, if you know where the if if you have the files the source files as you open them in sorted order, you can search where what file that offset corresponds to, and then you can subtract off that base, and you can do a search within the file to get the local offset within the file. So maybe I'll call that the start. Um, and so. Um, I think what we really want, and arguably this should, this is probably going to get pulled into a separate module because it's something that's kind of not just a lexer function, it's, it's shared and it's a little more general, something the compiler really wants to manage in most cases. So I think what you want to basically do is you want to be able to say stuff like, you know, um, you can say source stir. Um, you get back a source. And in this case, I'm, going to, I'm just going to do an s stoop uh, to keep it simple. But we, we basically take ownership of the of this of this stuff because we want to own all our own resources. Um, I don't think I've implemented s stoop yet. I have a I have a huge list of of standard library functions I've sketched out but not implemented. So I'll just start doing stupid implementations of them on demand. So s stoop is just stir dupe, but it has an allocator argument, but we don't have optional arguments yet, so I'm going to leave out the allocator argument for convenience. But the idea is that um, basically almost everything that allocates uh, in the standard library is going to have an implicit allocator argument like this, and uh, it will use that if you specify it, but otherwise it won't. It will just use the default allocator. So, uh, and we're going to use that for all this stuff. Um, but since we don't have default arguments right now, uh, I'm just going to use the system allocator and just use loop c stir dupe. Like a lazy person, but this is going to go away. All these functions that allocate in the standard library will use your allocator or the default if you don't specify one. So uh, let's just do s dupe and, um, and start in this case. I guess really what you want to do here uh, is really something more like this. Um, is what you really want to say is um, let's see. I guess this needs like an end, which is as far as as far as it's gotten basically with the latest thing it parsed, um, and so the start is the current end in terms of that logical order. Um, and again, I think I showed it, but. Once we hook in our allocators, this will just be how we do it. Like there will be allocators for all of this stuff. This, this thing will have an allocator, and we'll just use that. But uh, the, the new system for doing allocation is designed to be easy to add after the fact, as long as you have a little bit of forethought, but um, but without forcing you to really restructure your code. So we're just going to do naive uh, naive 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 allocation for now. Uh, so we allocate a new source with those things filled in. Um, and well, actually, I guess um, 
let's uh, maybe do this. Um, I think this belongs with a string. Um, when len start is uh, start is indeed this, and then this thing becomes incremented by the length. And I guess this means we actually need another function I haven't implemented, but um, dupe, uh, which is simply again using there's going to be an allocator argument like here all of these imagine just these are not the final versions but uh, we'll stick those in after uh, we have done optional parameters named optional parameters um, so basically um, you know do this well, actually I guess you just do that no you don't actually we have that function it's called new char Alec copy. So what it's called. Alec copy size. Um, I'm just going to assume a line default alignment. Again, th these, these are going to be arguments for this thing uh, with defaults for the common case. But um, yeah. Um, do this. only have to do one string scan uh, to find the length and then we just actually that's not enough is it uh, we have to also do purely for parsing purposes you also want this to be zero terminated um, Eh, let's just use sdupe for now. That does all that stuff. No reason to get fancy. Um, just do it twice. Who cares for now? Uh, right. So mark where the cur mark this is where it starts. Um, increment this by that, uh, and then you also. an A push onto the sources. I mean, I don't know. Um, push this onto that. Turn it. existing implementations, but we don't want to use libc directly for anything. We'll just have to replace it later. So I'm just using this as a forcing function to at least fill in the simplest functions. Unresolved name, sources. Um, Stir dupe, I 
guess that's not there. Well, we can just do it ourselves. So, um, uh, alloc one byte alignment. Uh, do a copy. Um, Old. Let's come this buff. Copy that over, and then we set that to null. We also need to do a copy, and this will be. Let's see where we are. So Okay. So presumably this just works as before. But then the idea is you can also um Let's say there's also maybe a name, which is just, I don't know, human human readable. Um, and actually for now, let's let's just uh, let's just use this just so if we're in the debugger we, we can kind of see something. Basically. Okay. Um, So now we should be able to um, if we lex a source file. One thing you have to be careful about, I think, is So let me mention a general principle that I want to be able to support, something we actually didn't support fully in the old Lexer because we didn't really need it. But I want to basically be able to have full item potency. I want to be able to go back to a buffer I've already processed, the source file, and completely re, re, or relex it and even reparse it as well from any arbitrary point without having to store the original tokens or anything. So I want to be able to just jump the cursor back to the middle of a file, source file and um, redo some stuff. So we have to be careful about anything that's not item potent. And anything that doesn't, if you do it a second time, does nothing essentially. So something like this is actually not what you want to do. You have to do it in a guarded way. And I think what you do is you say, um, basically, you want to look at whether the thing you're about to add is uh, after the last one or something like that. So. Um, So I think what you want to say is if the uh, you know first off if this is not zero, and then we can look at um,
if the buffer is not empty um, and the last element is actually strictly before the offset, then we, we add the offset there. So the, the one thing we can assume, when I say we go back and we reparse, the one thing we can assume is that the buffer hasn't been touched before. Oh, sorry, it hasn't been mutated in place. We're never going to mutate the buffer in place after the fact. We make our own copy, regardless of what was, if we read it from disk, we don't reread it from disk, we keep it in memory. Uh, so we don't have to worry about, you know, like the line endings moving or something weird, but we can ha potentially have, you know, we make some progress and then I jump back before we finish uh, lexing the file. And at that point, all the new lines I'll see are essentially going to be rehashes of stuff I've already seen. So we only want to add new line breaks that are beyond the frontier of what we've done. So this is essentially what this achieves. And uh, let's test it. And actually you want to only do this as well. But no, this is, yeah, this is going to be a little bit suspect. Actually, let me remove that for now. Um, because I think what you want to, no, actually, I think that's fine. I think what you want to do is when you set the cursor of a, of a lexer to point to the middle of an existing file, I think what you end up doing is you synchronize the li line count by a binary search, uh, and then at that point, this is actually correct. But this is not correct, basically. This is correct here. So in the case where we rewind and go back into the middle of the file, it, the, this line variable will be initialized using a binary search on this existing line buffer, uh, line, line offset buffer, in order to resync but then and then at that point this will actually be correct because then the initial value it won't start at zero it won't start at whatever value it had before it'll start at the right offset um, un unless you you fast forward into the file so this is maybe something you can't do either if you try to random access into the file before beyond where you've been you're not allowed to do that but you can always rewind and reparse and we'll see later this will be useful sometimes uh, in order to avoid storing too much data that we could just calculate on demand by going back to the lexer because we already still have the source buffer. So I, I have some, th there's a bunch of things along these lines that I have planned for the new system and this is sort of a, a taster of that, I guess. So let's, let's see what this does. Um, so let's go and look at the, um, so, so here we have, let's look at some of these things. Um, so you can see the end here is this, and um, okay, we didn't, okay, so, so clearly that logic wasn't right. just a logic bug. So if it's either empty, in which case there is no last element, and so clearly this is true, or if the last element is before the offset we're adding. That's right. Um, no, that's not right because, well, actually maybe it is. I haven't done NatViz helpers yet. For, um, for this stuff, but you can always do something like uh, oh, it does look like there's only one, so I guess there is a logic bug. No, oh, yeah, sorry. not token start. What am I? That's, that's the bug. It's the lexer start. Um, I think this is what we do. Um, 
is actually not a feature of the lexer. This is just a way of saying, hey, there's a line break. Um, So if we have nothing or this thing, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So it says there's one at offset one, which is correct. So the second line begins, of course, the first line begins at zero, right? So you don't store that. Second line begins at one. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight is the new line. So you can see this is kind of the idea. Um, um, Let's go about another 30 minutes. Haven't done so much progress, but um, it's fine. Most of that will probably happen off stream anyway. Um, but yeah, I want to set the rudiments up right. One of, one of the mistakes I made with the old system is that, I mean, it, I don't know if it was a mistake. It was a good way to get started. But uh, once we started getting to dealing with uh, multiple files and stuff like that, uh, the responsibility for who was managing those buffers and managing some of the associated data became very messy. So one thing I want to handle properly now is to centralize management of that stuff and be very clear about who is using something versus who, who is owning something. So the idea is that this sources object is going to be the owner of everything related to basically querying for source positions and um, in managing the buffers for the underlying things and their names and paths and stuff like that. Um, so, okay, but let's do some queries now using this data. So for example, um, suppose someone gives you um, a position. Um, So we, I think we, I sketched out how I would write some of this code last time. But let's say um, you want to find the source corresponding to a position. So how do you do that? And I'm just going to do linear search for now. But of course, you can do binary search because it's a sorted, uh, sorted list. So uh, you go through your, uh, your list of sources. And um, For each of them, you uh, you basically check whether 
Um, so I guess this would be start plus uh, len. And so since your search is in sorted order, you don't have to actually compare to the start. So you find the first time where you're within the end. So if this is less than the end, um, then, or if the post is less than that, then this is your guy. Otherwise, we return null. Um, actually, before we even get to that, let's test with multiple test strings. Um, let's do something like this. Um, and actually, we don't even need to use the lexer for this. So, I mean, we can have this at the end, but um, Let's just say this is source one. So we'll continue using that. And then we also have uh, source two. For this one. So you can see the start position is exactly where this one ends, 14. And if you go and look at the sources, there's now 21 is the end. So you can see that 21 is 14 plus uh, 7. So now, if I take some position, um, like, well, actually, uh, what was it? Post source. Let's uh, let's take ten. Uh, let's see what that gives, and then we'll do another one with twenty, and we'll do one with. 30, which should be beyond everything. Duplicate definition. Wait, what? Where did this file come from? <laughs> S.ion? Am I losing it? I am a psychotic breakdown. Where did this file come from? An exact copy. What happened there? It's truly bizarre. Um, what in the world? Um, okay. And 
this clearly didn't recompile because it's not showing the updated Why is there no local variable called source? It's like it still hasn't regenerated properly. Yeah, it hasn't. as if this is a totally different file. Then that's so strange. And now I got this SI on. What? This must be some funky VC Proj stuff. I know the laziness thing is a little bit magic, but under no circumstances can I see, could I imagine it creating things that are copies of existing files with the right file extension and everything. Um, what was the thing called? Ion BZ Proj. shit I've seen in a while. Where is it resurrecting that file from? Let me try closing Visual Studio. I don't know why, but it's just like Occam's Razor. Although I've never seen anything like that. I don't see how it could It's truly bizarre. Wait, what was that? So it was... I think it was VC Prod, or it was v, uh, VS. So it never saved those changes I was making. Okay, I, I need to look with some serious skepticism at my, uh, okay, uh, 
insane. Uh, three, four, five. Okay, now they're no, they're still not. Oh, they are here now. That really was Visual Studio, wasn't it? I have never seen anything like that. So it was not updating this buffer. It was somehow committing my changes to another file with a similar name. But it was still showing it as if I was making them under this buffer. That's next level. I feel like I've reached new, new, new depths in Visual Studio. That's insane. Um, all right, so let's see if it worked. So yeah, you can see that here, um, source three, it found the right buffer based on the position. Source four found the right buffer. Source five is beyond, uh, like the this cursor, you know, th this position 30 is beyond anything. And so there is no source uh, source object corresponding to that. So yeah, um, let's um, let's build some other source queries, position-based queries in, in this vein, and then we'll finish off. And then I'll do. There's a bunch of just like copy and paste uh, porting that we need to do, and that stuff is not very interesting. The stuff that I think is more interesting when we're looking at it as a rewrite, as opposed to just copy and pasting code, is like what kind of design changes are made. And I think a lot of it's going to be around this kind of thing. Like, how do you restructure the data and stuff like that so you can have more concise ways of pointing to the text. You, you can see basically the thing that's really cool about this representation is that first we already need somehow to store all this the source we're parsing centralized because we're doing this package system where there's all these different files coming in and we also have an API that wants to be able to for example feed in strings so it needs to deal not just with files on disk but also strings so there needs to be some way of managing all this different stuff. Um, and you can't have the user manage those things, like the string, for example. We have to take ownership, otherwise it could go away, and who knows. Um, and as soon as you do that, you can do this kind of thing pretty easily, because now you fully, you know, you fully, in, you fully copy in a version of a source text, wherever it's from. And at that point, we have this globally unique sequence offset that can actually be used to index anything. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty, it's a very compact way of, um, of addressing all of the files that are sucked in basically and so now the idea is that anytime you want to refer to any file um, any position in a file you just have a single 32-bit index that does all of that that's pretty cool right um, so you can see we can find the file object and from there we can find whatever um, next step is to find the line and column which is just a two-level search of the same sort and again binary search in general uh, is what you'll do but um, um, if you, uh, so, so now let's extend this and um, essentially we start by finding the source object. Um, let's just say we return minus one if there is no file. And um, otherwise we basically have to do the same sort of search we just did, but now within the um, the lines. So um, we'll we'll construct an offset from the start of the file. So keep in mind this position is like a global absolute index. So in order to relate it to these line offsets, we are going to subtract that off. Right? We're going to rebase it off of the start of the file, and then that's the offset we're going to use. And then we say basically, as soon as this is, I guess, greater than or equal, then we return a match. Otherwise, we return minus one if we don't get anything. Um, Well, let's just do line info for 
now. You can do column info in the same way because once you uh, once you have this, then the, the offset from the previous line is going to be the column offset, right? The difference in, uh, let's see, you once you know this is greater than this, you subtract off the, your thing from that, and that's your uh, column offset as well. But let's just do this version first. Um, and so, Disconnected, so I'm just gonna wait for it to reconnect. But I also have to wrap up. It's been a little more than two hours, so I'm just gonna test this line thing just to sort of. Okay, we're back. It disconnected for a second. Um, yeah, so I said I'm just gonna uh, test the line search, and uh, probably even gonna stop the stream. Um, Let's, let's try this as an example. So we pick what should be, you know, global position zero, which just means the very first byte of the very first file. So we found the first file, the offset should be zero. Uh, and so, oh, I'm sorry. We, we can only do this after it's been lexed, right? Um, It still says minus one. Um, let me see why. Sorry, I guess it's the other way around, really. Um, Um, if you're on the first line, it means the offset is, yeah, it is before this. That is correct. If you get all the way to the end, actually, well, I guess, let me just do this. Um, so this is line zero. This is line one. Keep in mind, counting it as zero based, right? This should be minus one or three. Okay. So let's see here. Oh, yeah, I guess we're still in this part of the file. Um, if we go in like, I guess, 15, which would be in, in source two. I'm oh, sorry, that's not going to work. Shadows. Actually, you know what? Instead of just being a moron and clicking past all these annoying workflow things, why do I always get this warning that jumps into a weird XML file? But anyway, let me uh, let's see what happens here. So this gives zero, and that's just because we haven't parsed that file. And so if you if if, if you try to ask for the line in something that straight up doesn't exist, like a source file that doesn't exist, it's just going to say. Um, You know what, I think I have a better way of doing this stuff. Um, so if you look at the source, um, uh, let's keep a frontier, which is like as far as we've gotten basically, if that makes sense. Um, this is not really a post because post is an absolute position. So, um, uh, 
Nah. Actually, I don't think we want to do that. Let's just keep this. That's fine. So if you ask for a line of something that hasn't been lexed, and then we can have other ways of making sure that doesn't happen, but um, with some kind of high watermark of, of, of where the lexer's ever been, is basically what you want to do, so that if the lexer gets to a certain point, it wants to set, this is the furthest, the furthest it's gone. Um, like, you know, every time it lexes a token, you can say self-source uh, watermark blah, but maybe that's a little bit inefficient to do by default. So maybe you only want to do that at coarser checkpoints. But anyway, um, that's kind of the idea. Uh, and I think we're going to step the stream. So this was not much lexing, a bunch of debugging. Also, I have something on my to-do list now for fixing those weird tuple issues. I also have some bugs on that on Discord, so those need to be fixed anyway. But you can kind of see the idea is we have, we're going to have a more structured way of managing different kinds of source in a centralized place. Then we get a, this very compact way of referring to anywhere in any file, any offset. And from that, we will be able to efficiently query line information, column information, without having to store it in every single token. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and indeed, tokens themselves won't have to store that either. <clears throat> so so the, the, the point about this is, in most cases, you, um, like, basically, let's say there's two cases where you need uh, source info, very detailed source info beyond know it's usually just in time for things like um, errors which are generally sparse right so those are uh, such a rare occasion relatively speaking to all the tokens being parsed that you don't want to fatten things up with that um, and so it's better just to query that on demand that's one case the other case is maybe you actually want to emit a fully position annotated like fully line and column annotated AST for an IDE or something like that. In that case, though, you can just basically do this thing, but in a single linear pass. So this is the random access version, but you can imagine a version of this that basically, rather than doing a search per position, it essentially just blasts through in a separate pass and generates all the data in a linear pass, but only when you need it. And so it's better to optimize for the common case, which is where we do need to be able to get source information about where the line is and the column is and what the file name is, but we can just figure that out in the, you know, relatively speaking, if we have a megabyte of source code, maybe there's, you know, even if we have a bunch of warnings, like that's a that's like a dozen lookups we have to do like that. And we can do them with binary search. Right now we're doing linear search, but these are obviously binary searchable because they're sorted. So that's the idea. Hope that makes sense. I now have stuff on my plate. I have to fix some of these compiler bugs, and uh, I am going to actually try to write the Lex run until next stream, unlike what I said last time, where I mostly ended up fixing compiler issues. Um, I will probably uh, push, uh, no, I will push, I will start, I'll keep pushing compiler fixes. I will also push my VC proj generator. I might add a solution generator to go along with it. Um, but maybe that's a little bit too much. Uh, I think even for now, as long as you have a basic stub solution and you're okay with just you know doing your manual and solution if you're using Visual Studio, this is a pretty good way to do it. Um, um, so at the very least, I'll share that and maybe people can suggest improvements. But uh, anyway, that's it for me. Um, I'm pretty excited actually to get into this stuff. The lecture itself is extremely boring. That's why I. Well, aside from the fact that I had plenty of compiler stuff to keep me busy, I couldn't motivate myself to work on the Lexer because it's so boring and obvious stuff at this point. Uh, but that's also a good reason to do it just to get started. But I think the stuff that actually is worth getting right uh, and sort of requires a little bit of design refinement is source management, position to source info mapping, and all this other stuff. Um, so, I mean, actually, let's let's maybe wrap that up uh, right here. Um, Maybe that's what we want to call it. So say you can do um, actually this. This would be a good query function. So maybe actually what you want to do is um, let's actually finish that off. Um, source info. Or I guess it would be post info. Um, and so step one is we get the posts. Just return a null 
little thing here. Otherwise, we basically we do. This, so let's say this function is going away. Um, and so once we have this, um, let's see. There's two cases. Uh, if i is equal to zero, then we just use the offset. Otherwise, we use the offset minus the previous line start. Um, and so then this is simply uh, i equal. Uh, in this case, I guess it's the same kind of deal. Um, this. Okay, so it's any time it really insists on saying when a command fails, a pre-built command fails, it wants to do this. Maybe I should just not put it in as a pre-built event, but I should put it as a custom built step. Does it have Similar error for that, so maybe maybe that's a good motivation to put it as a custom build step. It doesn't matter. I was just using a pre-build pre event, but um, let's see. So what was it saying here? Post source. Right. I need to provide the sources to reference. Um, shadow definition. Um, okay. So let's see if this works. So zero, column zero. So offset one, that all looks good. So this is offset four. And so column three. So let's look at these guys. I mean, I don't know if this is totally right, but it looks, I mean, it's, yeah, I know this is definitely right for the, because the start is 14, so that would be correct. So yeah, this uh, looks reasonable. Um, let's call it a day for the stream. Uh, I will be working on this, but I will also have, I'll have to focus a little bit on focusing, uh, fixing all these bugs so we don't keep running into it on stream for one. Uh, but I will also be making good headway on, on this and, uh, and on sort of the, the source management side and I really do hope we can get to ASTs next time because I have a lot of thoughts. And then we'll tie into some of this stuff. A lot of it is about how to store things more space compactly without having to get rid of pointers for everything because that mostly helps on 64-bit. And while that's important, of course, most desktop machines are 64-bit, um, uh, I care about 
I care more about stuff that helps on 32-bit because eventually we're going to have to run this on small embedded, smaller embedded systems that are, well, and they will have DRAM, but they won't have gigabytes of DRAM. So, um, and, and they will be slower to access DRAM. Uh, but anyway, um, that's, that's it for, for today. I'll be back, let's see, this is Wednesday, so I guess I'll be back on Friday. Uh, and hopefully we'll do AST stuff then. And uh, I'll be pushing compiler fixes. Uh, let me know, especially on Discord, it's the easiest way. I can turn on fixes pretty quick. If you run into stuff with a compiler, let me know there, and I will get fixes to you pretty quick. All right, that's enough for today. I will see you on Friday.